Thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here and to be part of um, the lecture series again this year. And excited today to talk a little bit about my uh, trajectory uh, and my scientific background and a little bit about uh, CRISPR as well and where CRISPR is today. Let me share my slides. Okay, can everyone see my slides? We can see your slides. Perfect. <clears throat> and sorry, I'm uh, recovering from uh, a little cough that I had, so I might do some uh, short pauses. But uh, yeah, as I said, I'm very excited to tell you a little bit about my trajectory and my pathway to science. And really, um, it all started here in Costa Rica, a very small country. My parents are immigrants that came from Taiwan all the way to Costa Rica in the early 80s. And I was very fortunate to be able to grow up in this country. Costa Rica is a small country with about 5.1 million people. And we're known for uh, having a culture of Pura Vida. Pura Vida means pure life. And it really embodies the way that we uh, kind of see the world and how we were surrounded by so much nature and how we wanted to kind of take all of this in as part um, of our day to day. And really it was an awesome place to grow up and to uh, be influenced by all this nature and be excited uh, about science as well and everything that was surrounding me. And then I think one of the things that really was important for me during my uh, upbringing there was Dr. Franklin Chan Diaz. This is the first astronaut born in Latin America and he is, uh, he was born in Costa Rica. He was the first one to go to space. And for me and for many of the people who were born in the 90s in Costa Rica, seeing someone come out of, um, come out of our little country and be able to reach the stars really signaled to me that if I had big dreams and if someone had done it who had come out of the same country, then I could also make it. And that really showed me uh, the importance of role models because without Franklin Chan Diaz, I don't think that I would have uh, aimed as high as I did. So um, really, I think I'm still very grateful for that role model that I had. And then I'd say that I started to get interested in genetics when Dolly, the first mammal, was cloned in 1996. At that time, I was eight years old. I didn't really understand what cloning was. I didn't know what DNA was, but I knew that this was something fundamentally changing uh, the way we understood the world and the things that we we're capable of. So for me, this moment, I think it's really ingrained in my head of um, the first time I heard about DNA and the first time I started thinking about DNA and genetics, uh, and it really influenced my trajectory moving forward. And then the second thing that I think for me was important moving into more of biology was HIV and the search for a vaccine and a cure. For a lot of people who were born in the 90s, there was no vaccine, uh, there was no cure, and we kept hearing all these really horrible things that were happening with HIV and the spread and how uh, very little treatments were available at that time, as well as a lot of stigma. So for me, it seemed like a great um, pathogen, a great virus to focus on and to study. And I really thought that uh, once I finished high school, that was something that I really wanted to pursue and uh, have a career in. And uh, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to stop me. I can't really see your faces right now. Uh, so um, just feel free to interrupt me at any time. But um, I was really lucky. Uh, my parents really had a strong focus on education. And one of the things that they made sure that me and my brothers had was a strong education. They put me in a German high school uh, when I was a small kid. They wanted me to have a trilingual education. And that really allowed me to then go to Germany with the help of a scholarship um, to uh, study my bachelor's and my master's. And I went to Germany without really knowing what I wanted to study, uh, I thought I chose, I would choose something that would allow me to have kind of a broad training. So I chose engineering physics because uh, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to be an engineer or whether I wanted to be a scientist, but I wanted to have those possibilities. So I went there and uh, I have a picture here of the TU Munich, the university I went to. 
Uh, this is a slide that goes from the fourth floor all the way down to the first floor. Um, and it's, it's in the shape of a parable, uh, which I thought was really cool. And a lot of professors and students would use to go down from the upper floors down to the bottom. Um, and I, for me, what was, I think something really important that I learned during this time is that there were, a, well, university was a lot harder than I expected. Uh, my first year, I didn't pass a lot of the courses. A lot of people recommended that I should switch to a different career because physics was really hard. And I really considered during that time, maybe uh, to make a career move, maybe do something that had less uh, STEM, less math. Uh, but uh, I am also very stubborn. So I decided to con continue pushing. Uh, and I was able to then uh, switch things over after a year and start passing courses. Uh, so I think one of the first lessons that I wanted to share with you and that for me was really important during this time was to not let early failures define the rest of your studies or your career. When you go to college, it can feel really jarring if uh, you're coming from high school and you're doing really well and then all of a sudden uh, things are a lot harder. Um, and it's important to push through that, but also to seek advice and counsel during that time and to make sure that those failures really do not define your career. Um, the other thing that I realized really quickly when I first uh, went to Germany was that I didn't enjoy classes as much. So as soon as I could, I started to look for research opportunities to really do or get hands-on experience doing research. And because as I mentioned in the past, I was really interested in DNA. I decided to join a lab that was using DNA as a building block. So instead of using its genetic encoded information, it was used to construct a lot of little machines. And here you can see, for example, uh, DNA was being used to create these smileys. Um, and you can see a bunch of smileys here that are created completely of DNA. It's almost a little bit creepy if you look at uh, a bunch of this together. But for me, it was fascinating that DNA could be used for something that it actually wasn't built for. Um, and I thought I'd talk really briefly about how this happens. This is called DNA origami, uh, which allows molecular self-assembly of nanostructures. If you're familiar with DNA, it is double-stranded. You have two stranded, one that's complementary to the, to the other. But if you started from a single-stranded DNA and you created what we call a staple, this staple is just a little piece of DNA that has complementarity to some parts of this single-stranded DNA. You can start to kind of bind parts of that single-stranded DNA together or staple them. And if you put a lot of these staples together, you can create a compact DNA nanostructure. And what's really cool is that you, you can do not only smileys and rectangles, you can really create a lot of different structures, 3D structures, uh, robots that can move. There's a lot of di dynamic things that you can create. You can create tires, for example. So there's a whole field that at that time in the uh, 2009, when I was working in this or 2011, was very, very new. And since then it's grown to uh, a lot of uh, much larger scale. And it's really exciting, I think, as a field as well. Some people think, for example, about these boxes and how you could use this to deliver drugs to specific cells. Um, I would say at the time I was studying physics and for me, it was really hard to understand how I could use this DNA um, boxes and smileys uh, for something more functional. And because as I mentioned in the past, I was interested in vaccines and HIV and I was interested in genetics. I decided that I needed to go somewhere else to get more experience uh, and to learn a little bit about how you could apply physics and engineering physics to biochemistry, biology, and all those important questions that for me were very exciting still. So I applied to a bunch of different labs across the UK, across Germany, across um, the US. And I think I applied to maybe uh, 12 to 15 different places and 99% of those places said no. There was only a single place that said yes, which was in the UK. They said, yes, you can come if you can find your own funding. Uh, so after that, I applied to a lot, a lot of different grant mechanisms and was able to find one. And this allowed me to go to the University of Cambridge for a year to do research. 
and introduced me to epigenetics. Um, and as I mentioned, I was really excited before in the field of DNA origami, learning how you could fold DNA into different shapes. But really, I wanted to understand the question of how is DNA folded within the nucleus of cells in humans, for example, or in, or in living beings, and how does that translate to function uh, in each of our cells? So if you imagine each cell in your body, we have over two meters of DNA, and then uh, that's folded into a very, very small uh, volume within the nucleus of your cell, which is, I think, uh, about 100,000 times smaller uh, than uh, the length of that DNA. And then during my time in the UK, I learned that the way DNA is packaged uh, is with the help of these proteins called histones, and that these histones, uh, which DNA is negatively charged, the histones are positively charged. This really keeps DNA uh, compacted in a very organized manner within the cell. And what's really cool about these histones is that they have these tails that come out of the DNA. These tails can be modified chemically and that can allow DNA to be either more compact or more open just based on the charge uh, that those modifications kind of give the histones. Um, for me, this was super exciting as a field. And I, after a year of doing research there, I really wanted to learn more. So I applied to a lot of different labs uh, for a PhD across the US, across the UK. Uh, I think I applied to, again, about 20 different uh, PhD programs and only got accepted to one, uh, which was at the University of Pennsylvania, where I then decided to work in the lab of Dr. Shelley Berger. And really the question that I wanted to focus on during my PhD was how from a single genome, we get over 200 different cell types from a single fertilized egg, we start all from the single cell. How do we get cells that have such different properties like epithelial cells in your skin, nerve cells, uh, immune cells, cardiac cells, bone cells, all these cells have the same DNA and the same information. How do they uh, kind of get this identity and maintain this identity? And especially when we think a little bit about um, what's leading to these cells having different properties, what we know is that uh, it really depends on what genes are active or inactive in those cells. And I think for me, what's fascinating is that really only two to 3% of your DNA encodes for proteins or for genes. And there's this entire uh, blue part here that for a long time people called junk DNA because we didn't really know what it was doing. We thought it was just spacers. Uh, but what we've learned in the past uh, several years and decades is that over 80% of this blue part of this non-coding DNA is now believed to be important uh, to regulate the expression of this uh, little two to three percent of protein coding genes. Uh, so during my PhD, I focused on a specific subset of this blue uh, part of DNA called enhancers, which are non-coding regions of DNA that regulate cell type specific ex expression and maintain cell identity. Uh, and then what we've seen, for example, is if we look at a gene that's expressed both in the brain as well as in the limbs, we don't really understand what's regulating the expression of that gene in those two spots. But what we've learned is that there's this, this parts called uh, enhancers of non-coding DNA where we can have transcription factors, which are proteins that bind to DNA, that bind to those sites, bring that site closer to the beginning of the gene and activate expression of that gene and that those sites or enhancers can be very different in the brain in the limbs and regulate expression in very different ways and then in a similar way there are also proteins that can stop uh, expression so for me this was fascinating uh, i focused on a specific protein called p63 which is a transcription factor that binds to enhancers and it's really important for epithelial identity if you knock out P63 in mice, you can see that the mice do not develop eyelids. They do not have hair follicles and they uh, have permeable skin, so they cannot survive. In humans, what we know is that su uh, substitution mutations in different parts of this protein can lead to um, very severe phenotypes. Uh, for example, craniofacial and limb malformations 
as well as skin erosions, fused eyelids. Uh, so I really wanted to understand how those mutations were leading to uh, specifically creating a cleft lip palate, which affects one in 700 newborns. So um, my fi five years, or part of my five years during my PhD really focused on studying this protein and how it uh, affected cleft lip palate. But then I've always been interested as well uh, beyond the science that we can do in the lab, how science affects society overall. So one of the things that I did during my time at Penn was I founded the Penn Science Diplomacy Group, which fosters collaborations that can cross borders. And a lot of the work in this diplomacy group was thinking about how science has contributed to uh, diplomacy in the past, for example, during the Cold War, where science was one of the few avenues that allowed communication between the Soviets and the US. And there was a lot of collaboration during the different space programs as well. Um, and then this continues to this date where a lot of the science, for example, during the Iran nuclear deal, uh, a lot of the work was happening between scientists to promote that diplomatic, uh, those diplomatic ties. And then the other thing that I focused on during my PhD was creating a podcast called Caminos en Ciencia. Uh, and for any of you Spanish speakers, this is, uh, this is a podcast full in Spanish where we interview different people across the entire Latin American region. And really this, I think is, is a mirror of how important Franklin Chan Diaz, the astronaut was for me and the need that our community has of role models and being able to see themselves represented uh, in the careers that they want in the future, but also not only so beyond representation, also understand what are the specific challenges and unique challenges that our community faces getting to those, getting to those careers. So overall, um, I think something that was really important for me was during my PhD and also during the past COVID pandemic or current uh, ongoing pandemic, that there is a growing mistrust in science and that we really need to improve that through three specific ways. Uh, one of them is improving science communication, giving scientists tools to communicate uh, the work that they're doing and the importance of it. We also need to increase diversity in science uh, because we need to have people from different communities represented in, at the scientific table making decisions because in the past, this was not the case and there have been um, really, really terrible incidents uh, in the name of science because of this. So I think increasing diversity is really paramount to moving science forward and increasing trust. And then finally, I think we need to, as scientists, learn how to allow and accept uncertainty. Uh, and uh, if many of you are going into a scientific career, there is often a push towards nice close stories where there's a uh, little uncertainty, but we need to find ways to allow the uncertainty to, uh, to be also communicated and shared. And then this all takes me to um, my next step uh, after my PhD, which was I had been working with DNA from building different things with DNA, then understanding how DNA is um, organized within the nucleus of cells, understanding how it leads to identity of different cells. But I really wanted to then understand not only how DNA controls traits, but how we can modify DNA. But if some of you are familiar with 23andMe or have even done it, you know that DNA not only controls uh, disease, there's a lot of different things that uh, are encoded in our DNA. For example, cheek dimples, cilantro taste aversion. A lot of people find that cilantro tastes like soap, uh, dandruff, earlobe type, uh, earwax type. This is something that I, for example, didn't know until uh, I married my wife. Uh, my wife has more of a waxy type uh, or like wet wax and mine is very dry. So these are things that I, I didn't know were different, but even things like fear of public speaking uh, are encoded par partially within our DNA. And then as I mentioned, there are several diseases that are encoded within our DNA, cystic fibrosis, which is the one that I work on today, uh, as well as um, different 
the bifunctional protein deficiency, familiar dysautonomia. And I think what's really exciting now is that there is a tool called CRISPR that lets us change DNA and potentially could lead to cures for a lot of these diseases. We already had tools to uh, manipulate DNA, but CRISPR really has come to make this a lot easier. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how this is possible. So at the end of my PhD uh, here in Philly, I decided that I wanted to uh, learn more about CRISPR. So I applied to different labs, both in Boston as well as in the Bay Area, and uh, was very lucky to get the opportunity to go work with Jennifer Doudna. Uh, here you can see Jennifer, um, and this is a picture of the Doudna lab in 2019 uh, during one of our lab trips. Uh, I see some questions in the chat. Uh, should we maybe briefly stop? Okay. Um, okay, we can go through them in a little bit as well. So uh, I'll start, I'll give you a quick introduction of CRISPR first. So CRISPR uh, stands for Clustered Regulatory, Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. And people uh, always forget what it stands for because it's <laughs> pretty complicated. So we refer to it just as CRISPR. And I have a little video here that shows where CRISPR comes from. Let me see if I can play this. So in this video, we can see bacteria that are represented by these uh, brown tubes. And they are currently experimenting uh, viral infections. So bacteria like human beings uh, and other animals can also experience viral infections. Here we can see little viruses called bacteriophages that can infect uh, viruses specifically. Here we see a pink bacteriophage that's injecting its, uh, its nucleic acid into the bacteria. And if the bacteria, like the one in this video, have CRISPR systems, they'll be able to handle this in a very specific manner. So you'll see here the phage is injecting its DNA if the bacteria has a CRISPR system, it will cut a little piece of that DNA and incorporate it into a part of its own genome called CRISPR DNA. So this CRISPR DNA, as you can see, has little uh, pieces of different viruses. Each of these colors represent a different uh, bacteriophage that it has encountered in the past. So CRISPR DNA is basically a little bit like a library of different infections that have uh, that this uh, bacteria has experienced in the past. And it is interspaced by repeat sequences, which gives CRISPR its name as well. So if there's a new infection, what happens is that that part, this entire CRISPR DNA locus would be transcribed into CRISPR RNA. And then what's really important is that this has to be separated into separate into different pieces of uh, CRISPR RNA, each representing a different uh, infection. And then here we see what we call tracer RNA, which was discovered by Emmanuel Charpentier, who was the co uh, co awarded uh, Nobel Prize winner in 2020. Uh, this tracer RNA really binds to this repeat sequence that I mentioned before and allows this entire, uh, this entire nucleic acid to be loaded on Cas9, which is a protein. Uh, and then this Cas9, which now has uh, the different nucleic acids loaded, can start to go around the entire bacteria. Oh, sorry about that. Take it back here. It can now go around the bacteria, surveil, and look at what the current infection is. And if it encounters that uh, piece of DNA that it had within its uh, memory or its library, it can then bind to it and produce a double stranded break. 
So this leads to the viral DNA to be cut into pieces and to be removed from the bacteria. So overall, this acts as an immune system that allows bacteria to protect themselves from uh, viral infections. And that might not be as intuitive as I think it is for me because I've seen it over and over again. But I have here an example that I hope makes this a, lot, a little bit more intuitive. If you think about the human genome with its 3 billion bases, if you were to paste that sequence into Word, you would cover over 1 million pages. So imagine 1 million pages in a Word document, all filled with A, T, Gs, and Cs. Um, what CRISPR now allows is you can find a segment of 20 bases almost anywhere in those 1 million pages and create a cut in that specific place. So if you think about editing, uh, the first step, if you're thinking about a video, for example, that you're editing, you want to be able to cut and then paste things uh, in a very controlled manner. And that's re really what CRISPR-Cas9 now allows. And for me, it's fascinating that you can go through 1 million pages relatively quickly and then identify 20 letters and cut in a very specific site. And that's really the reason why the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020 was awarded to my pre former boss, Jennifer Doudna, as well as uh, Emmanuel Charpentier for the development of a method for genome editing. And two parts that I mentioned in, uh, before were the tracer RNA as well as CRISPR RNA. And what they both discovered was that you can connect these two parts to create a single guide RNA, which uh, vastly facilitates uh, using CRISPR as an editing machine. But then the other thing that uh, Emmanuel as well as Jennifer discovered was that they can change the sequence of uh, CRISPR RNA, which in the bacteria was focused more on bacteriophages. You can now change it to almost any sequence and then move this entire cutting machinery almost anywhere within the uh, mammalian genome and other genomes as well. And because seeing is believing, I have here a little bit video showing how Cas9 uh, RNA is interacting with DNA and creating a double-stranded DNA break. So you can see here, Cas9 is on the DNA and it created a double-stranded break where you can see the cleaved DNA. Here's a second video that shows uh, how we would use this entire machine within, uh, for example, a human nucleus. So within this human nucleus, you can see there's a lot of DNA and there's also, as I mentioned in the past, uh, histones and uh, chromatin, so it's very compact. But what you can see here is that uh, CRISPR-Cas9 has the ability to go even through this really compact genome, start to look for sequences uh, that you've programmed it to find. And what's very surprising is that it can actually identify a sequence uh, that you've engineered it for, create, uh, bind to it, and create a double-stranded break. And then, Here's one of the examples of what you can do once you create that uh, double strand break. You can bring a piece of DNA and insert it into that site and use the repair machinery of the cell itself to repair that. And if you think a little bit about um, different mutations that can uh, lead to disease, for example, BRCA1 mutations in, uh, in breast cancer, you could not only cut out uh, the predisposition, but you could put in a healthy gene into that site. So um, I think the power of this technology is also that if something has DNA, we can edit it. And so far, here you can see some of the examples of things that we've been able to edit. We have mice, we have zebrafish, uh, frogs, Drosophila, C. elegans, uh, some plants as well as yeast. These are very common um, models that have been edited using CRISPR, but we've been able to do a lot more than that. Up to 280 organisms, uh, and this is probably outdated. We likely have a lot more organisms that have been edited using CRISPR so far. 
So uh, one of the things that CRISPR allows is it's really a toolbox with very diverse applications. And as Professor Klaas Gustafsson uh, described it during the Nobel Prize Award is that it opens completely new possibilities. We've seen animal models that have been generated very quickly using CRISPR. We can use it to study genetic variation very quickly. We've seen materials being uh, made using CRISPR. Uh, food is an area where uh, CRISPR can really change agriculture, fuel, drug development, gene surgery, so using it in humans. Uh, there's a lot of possibilities here. So it's, uh, I think, a very exciting time for this technology. And I think there's a lot of expectation as well as, as to what we can achieve. And in terms of the CRISPR toolkit, uh, there are different CRISPRs, Cas9, Cas12, that allow genome editing. Uh, people have also used this, pro this uh, enzymes to do DNA imaging by tagging, for example, this protein with a uh, green fluorescent protein. We've also tagged Cas9 with activators or repressors to activate or repress uh, gene expression. And we also have tools that instead of editing DNA can edit RNA, for example, Cas13. <clears throat> and it's not only uh, a possibility, it has been done. People have used, for example, CRISPR to edit and to treat a genetic disease called sickle cell. So sickle cell is a disease where your red blood cells, instead of having a more globular shape, have a sickle, sickle kind of shape. And this leads to a lot of, um, of the cells clumping together, uh, which, can, uh, which can lead to a lot of uh, pain in the patient. And really when you're looking at the DNA, uh, this is mostly due to one specific uh, a specific mutation that CRISPR-Cas9 could cut and repair. And in uh, 2019, I believe uh, Victoria Gray became the first patient to receive a treatment for sickle cell, or actually in 2018, I, I think. Uh, so this was the first patient to receive uh, CRISPR, uh, CRISPR therapy. And this is really exciting. Since then, Victoria Gray has mentioned in several different interviews. She used to have to go to the hospital several times um, in a year. And since then she has really had a complete change in her um, disease course. And it really opens up the possibility for cures in the future as well. One other, uh, one, other one that I wanted to highlight here was LCA10, uh, which is a type of blindness blindness that is genetically encoded. Uh, doctors tried for the first time using CRISPR in 2020 to uh, reverse or to correct the mutation that leads to blindness here. And then there's several other opportunities. Uh, base editing, which some of you might be familiar with, is a way of using uh, CRISPR-Cas9 not to create a double-stranded break, but to edit a specific base without having to uh, cut across the DNA. And there are several different diseases, for example, progeria, a disease that leads to um, accelerated aging. Uh, there, the calcium mutation is known, and uh, the, the, the lab of David Liu, who is one of the pioneers in base editing, has shown that this can be reversed in mice partially as well, opening the possibility of future treatments in humans. Then I think the second area when people ask about where we'll see the, the fastest uh, changes um, using CRISPR, one of the ones I think it's agriculture. And uh, with global hunger on the rise, we know that uh, if the population reaches about 9.8 billion by 2050, the, role, the world food production will need to rise by 70% and the food production in the developing world will need to double. And then the projected 70% increase in food production will have to overcome rising energy prices, growing depletion of underground aquifers, the continuing loss of farmland to urbanization, as well as increased drought and flooding resulting from climate change. So people really view CRISPR as a possible solution in terms of technology 
that can allow to maybe mitigate a lot of uh, the issues that will happen as the population continues to rise. And I wanted here to highlight an example, which is cassava, a threatened staple crop in the tropics. Cassava is to African peasant farmers as rice is to Asian farmers. It feeds nearly 1 billion people annually, so around 10% of the world. It is difficult to breed because the flowering is unpredictable. So why edit cassava? There's a couple of reasons. Cassava as uh, humans, as animals can also be afflicted by disease. This is a cassava brown streak, which renders cassava uh, unedible. And we can use genome editing to remove disease susceptibility genes or disable them to allow uh, production of cassava that will not be afflicted by this disease. And then the other one is uh, that cassava produces cyanogens. So we can use genome editing to create safer cassava to eat. And if you're not familiar with cassava, um, the bubbles in bubble tea are made out of cassava. So then uh, finally, I wanted to talk a little bit more about now that we can edit DNA, what should we edit? Here are a couple of examples of things that are uh, very controversial right now. For example, editing, um, editing sperm cells or egg cells or embryos. Um, editing food, for example, um, to make it less susceptible to diseases. And there's an example here, mosquitoes. We are now able to use something called gene drive to remove entire populations of mosquitoes or other uh, animals from an ecosystem. And I wanted to touch a little bit more on human germline editing here. Human germline editing, there is a big difference between what we call somatic cells versus germ cells. Somatic cells is what's already happening uh, nowadays, for example, with sickle cell, where the mutations that we do or we change are non-heritable. They only affect one individual. Whereas for germ cells, um, one of the reasons this is very controversial is the changes that we introduce here are gonna be inherited by um, the children of, of the people who receive these changes. So these are heritable, it's both individual as well as the offspring that are affected. And there are many, many ethical questions about editing the germline. <clears throat> there are both technical risks, philosophical risks, as well as social risks. In terms of the technical risks, there are off-target effects um, that have not been solved. We've been able to mitigate a lot of the off-target effects, but if you think about a sequence of 20 bases within 3 billion, uh, that sequence might repeat itself several times within your genome. So if you are intended to cut in one specific place, it's very possible that you'll um, by accident also cut in a other spot that has a very similar sequence. So there are tools that we've been developing and using to mitigate that, but there's still a lot that we need to continue learning. The other technical risk is uh, delivery. So if you introduce these machines, for example, into a sperm egg or a zygote or, uh, what, or into a full organism, what can happen is that you'll edit only a couple of those cells, but not the entire cells uh, within that organism. And you'll end up with what's known as a mosaic where some cells might have the edit and some others will not. And if you're thinking about a genetic disease that affects uh, a person uh, systemically, it will be maybe harder to uh, treat if only some cells are experiencing uh, the consequences of that genetic mutations while others are not because we weren't able to uh, efficiently edit all of the cells. <clears throat> There's also philosophical risks. Uh, for example, thinking a little bit about uh, consent, treating someone who doesn't exist yet or treating someone who uh, is not able to consent. There's also religious reasons. Um, one that I think is really important is what, what is considered treatment or an absolutely necessary versus enhancement. A lot of people are saying now that we have the ability to change the genome, should we go there? Should we change our ability to be underwater for longer? Should we change how our muscles grow? What is really treatment? What is enhancement? Um, and how do this term, is it 
black and white or is it more gray and more in between and then there's also social risks um there's uh a lot of this technology will not be accessible to the broader population so a lot of the inequity that's already existing uh, will be then encoded in the DNA moving forward. So uh, we need to think a lot about the, all these different risks and what it means um, to edit the germline and how that can affect society overall. And there are some guidelines uh, in February of 2017. There was the Human Genome Editing, Science, Ethics, and Governance meeting by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine that put together a lot of those ethical considerations. Um, and I think that there has been many meetings since then. But one of the things that also happened since 2017 is uh, there was a researcher, a scientist in China who edited um, with the germline editing in humans for the first time. This is He Zhangwei. Uh, he edited two um, female embryos uh, to remove their susceptibility to HIV. Um, and this was done without informing the patients or the patient's parents. Uh, so it was very unethical. Uh, there was a lot of pushback from the entire community. Uh, this person had to go to jail for several years as well. But it also really opened the discussion of designer babies. It's not only a possibility now, it has been done. So we really have to uh, open the conversation and think about uh, this scandal uh, and think about gene editing and how we wanna regulate this and what are the ethics behind it. And then uh, the other thing that I, Think a lot about is that it is urgent uh, to bring down the therapy costs. As I mentioned, these therapies will not be accessible to the vast majority of the population. So how do we make this cheaper? How do we think about countries like Costa Rica and uh, Guatemala or uh, countries in the uh, South Hemisphere? How are they going to access these technologies and how do we prevent it from being a technology that's only accessible here? We saw a lot of that happening during uh, COVID and when the first vaccines started to be deployed, how there was clear inequities in how that was distributed. So how do we uh, think about this with a, much, with a technology that has so much potential as well? But I wanted to uh, finish this part with uh, a little bit more of a positive note. If we think about the possibilities with CRISPR and what already has been done, the possibilities really are endless. In terms of basic research here, I wanted to highlight, um, for example, butterflies and their patterning. One of the things that we've been able to learn using CRISPR is how butterflies uh, create different patterns. And this was something that was really hard to study in the past, just because we didn't have the tools to easily manipulate different genes and understand how the patterning process happened. The other one that I think is interesting and worth mentioning in basic research is there, have, there are groups that are studying how, why humans walk or how they develop the ability to walk on two legs instead of four. Um, so they've been doing a lot of uh, CRISPR experiments in mice trying to understand what are the different mutations that can allow a mouse to start walking in two instead of four legs. And then uh, in medicine, as I mentioned, there are several new therapies, antibiotics, drug targets, diagnostics. CRISPR really plays a role in this entire process from basic research all the way into therapies. And there have been multiple um, clinical trials now done in humans using CRISPR, either for, for example, CAR T immunotherapy or um, for a lot of other genetic diseases. And then in agriculture, as I mentioned, there are so many things that this technology may allow. Uh, we can think, for example, about climate change and how a lot of parts of uh, the world will become drier. We can think about using CRISPR to make uh, crops that are tolerant to those changes uh, to allow food to remain available for the populations living in those places. 
And then I wanted to talk really briefly about uh, some of the work that I was doing while I was there. As I mentioned in the past, I worked in DNA origami, then I worked in epigenetics, um, and then I worked in genome editing. And um, let me just jump here. One of the key questions that I wanted to answer during my time in the Doudna lab is how do we efficiently and precisely insert large segments of DNA at targeted sites? And this really is a challenge that has not been solved yet. So it, it is a really key question that would allow us to repair entire deletions, replace exons, allow us to create cell-cell communication or more easily engineer that allow us to tag uh, different proteins uh, to, to answer basic biological questions, improve CAR T immunotherapy. So part of my work uh, in the data lab was uh, really focused on using the tools that I had uh, studied during my undergrad, for example, DNA origami, to think a little bit about this uh, challenge more as a physicist challenge where if we think about a long piece of DNA and we're trying to insert it into a specific site, we can imagine this as a jumping rope, for example, that's all tangled. But if we create a little bit of structure, bring structure to this really long piece of DNA, for example, using DNA origami, we should be able to more easily insert that uh, into a specific site. Uh, and that, that was the focus of my postdoc and my work in the Dalton lab where I studied how bringing an organization to this really long pieces of DNA could improve genome integration. And then during my time at the Dana lab, uh, Jennifer got the Nobel Prize in 2020. This was right in the middle of the pandemic. So as you can see, we had to celebrate with masks uh, and socially, socially isolated. But really, it was a fantastic time and opportunity being in her lab, learning uh, the newest techniques and having the possibility to um, see Jennifer's vision of how this technology could be deployed. I have another, um, another slide here um, where I saw her more recently. So we were able to finally have a picture without masks. This is one picture where you can see my dog, Petrie. Uh, giving Jennifer a handshake and congratulating, congratulating her on her Nobel Prize as well. Um, so I was there until 2021. I then moved to Bridge Biopharma, which is uh, a rare, rare disease company uh, that is looking for new treatments for rare diseases. And I spent a year there understanding how uh, different technologies can leave the lab and really be translated to human treatments. So that was a really exciting time for me. Uh, a lot of the technologies that or therapies that we were looking at were more traditional, like small molecules, antisense oligonucleotides. And I moved a little bit away from CRISPR, but then uh, about a year ago, I moved to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and I didn't have time to put new slides here, but cystic fibrosis is a mon monogenetic disease. Um, and it's a disease where CRISPR uh, and gene editing approaches would really allow us to find a cure for this disease. So uh, the work that I do here is I focus on looking at new startups. I focus on looking at uh, new technologies that are being developed, new improvements within CRISPR uh, that could allow that cure to happen. One of our key challenges is being able to take all that machinery and bring it to the lungs where a lot of the symptoms are. Um, so a lot of my time is also focused on how do we bring all those machines into specific organs within the body? And really, if you think about um, the future of these technologies, we need to learn how to, do, how to do that, not only for the lungs, but the brain, the pancreas, and a lot of the different organs within uh, the human. So that's what I focus on uh, these days. Um, 